Good evening, everyone. I hope all of you can hear me all right. Somebody type the letter Y so I know that you can. Okay, violinist, thank you. And violinist, since I'm talking to you anyway, why don't you go ahead and open the session with prayer, brother. The floor is yours. Let's open in prayer to begin the studies tonight, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to gather around your word and study it tonight, Father. And thank you for Romans and his another installment of his study that he's about to share with us. And I just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to really dig deep spiritually into your word. And into what you would want to have us know today. Help us to really be enriched spiritually from tonight's study. Be able to glean everything we can and be able to put it in our daily practice as well. In Christ's name, amen.
And amen. Thank you for that violinist. Well, I'm going to say it. You know I'm going to say it. There's no way I'm not going to say it. This is a discussion and not a lecture. Please feel free to contribute ideas, thoughts, insights, comments, relevant scriptures, and even questions. But if you would hold those questions to the end, because I am one sucker for rabbit trails. I love them myself. <clears throat> Thank you, violinist. But I have a lot to get to, and a rabbit trail will keep me from getting to all of it. After the fact, after the discussion, I'll be more than happy to entertain questions. So, having said that, as I always do at the beginning, let us begin, shall we? <clears throat> We are continuing in our series, beginning with Moses. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus caught up with and spoke with two dis disciples who were sad and perplexed about the arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection reports about Jesus, the one whom they, quote, trusted that it had been he that should have redeemed Israel, <clears throat> unquote. From Luke 24, 21. In response to their sadness and confusion, Jesus opened the scriptures to them. We read, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. From Luke 24, verse 27. Jesus could very well have included in his review of scriptures that concerned himself the fact that the Messiah was prophesied to be of the seed of Abraham, but it goes deeper than that, as we shall see. We read in Genesis 12, 1-3, Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee. <clears throat> so God was not even specific. Abraham, where he was going to be moving lock, stock, and barrel to some unknown point B. Abraham did it on God's word. God continued, and I will make thee a great nation. Now here's a man with no children, a barren wife. I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that curse thee and curse them them that I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham was not only Jesus was not only going to be of the line of Abraham, but all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of him, because of the Messiah that came from him. Matthew Henry says of this, In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This was the promise that crowned all the rest, for it points at the Messiah. Surely, Jesus would have included this verse points of the Messiah in whom all the promises are yea and amen. What better verse to quote to these two despondent disciples on the road to Emmaus? Note number one, Jesus Christ is the blessing of the world. The greatest that ever the world was blessed with. He is a family blessing and by him salvation is brought to the house from Luke 19 and verse 9. <clears throat> Henry continues, when, he, when we reckon upon our family blessings, let us put Christ in the, in the imp, imprimi, 
the first place as the blessing of blessings. And how all the families of the earth are blessed in Christ. And so many are strangers to him. Answer, number one, all that are blessed are blessed in him as we read in Acts 4 and verse 12. To all that believe, of what family soever they shall be, shall be blessed in him. Verse 3, some of all the families of the earth are blessed in him. Number 4, there are some blessings which all the families of the earth are blessed within Christ. For the gospel salvation is a common salvation. And by common, he means available to all. And I think I needed to clar clarify that for the potential for the word common to be misunderstood in that phrase. For two, it is a great honor to be related to Christ. This made Abraham's name great that the Messiah was to descend from his loins much more than that he should be the father of many nations. It was Abram's honor to be his father by nature. It will be ours to be his brethren by grace from Matthew 12, verse 50. quote from Matthew Henry. <clears throat> now the Expositor's Bible adds to this, in, these, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Here as elsewhere, a clear hope sprang from faith. Recognizing God, Abram knew that there was for men a great future. He looked forward to a time when all men should believe as he did, and in him all the families of the earth should be blessed. <clears throat> that was truly a great blessing. And it's easy to read over that blessing and not realize the power of it. This is God speaking to him. And saying to him, through you, all, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. That's incredible. <clears throat> about in these early days when all men were on the move and striving to make a name and place for themselves, an onward look might be common. But the far-reaching extent, certainty, and the definiteness of Abraham's view of the future were <clears throat> unexampled. There, far back in the hazy dawn, he stood while the morning mists hid the horizon from every other eye. And he alone discerns what is to be. <clears throat> one clear voice and only one clear voice and only one rings out in the unfaltering tones and from amidst the babble of voices that other either amazing follies or misdirected yearnings gives the one true forecast and direction, the one living word <clears throat> which has separated itself from and survived all the prognostications of Chaldean soothsayers and priests of Ur, because it has never ceased to give life to men. It was a blessing that is still in operation and execution and benefit as I, as I speak these words. It has created for itself a channel. You could trace it through the centuries by the living green of its banks and the life it gives, it, it gives as it goes. For this hope of Abraham has been fulfilled, and I add, is being fulfilled. <clears throat> Creed and its accompanying blessing. 
which that day lived in the heart of one man only, has brought blessings to all the families of the earth. Unquote. <clears throat> As we move forward in our review and the exam examination of those things, <clears throat> which Jesus could have cited beginning with Moses, was the person, the kingship, and the priesthood of Melchizedek. Now here it's interesting to note <clears throat> that whoever Melchizedek was, he was both a king and a priest. Now, such a, an occupational designation was illegal <clears throat> in Israel. Only the Levites could be priests. And once Saul showed himself to be unworthy to be king, <clears throat> and the line went to David, that no king could also be a priest. And King Saul, the first king of Israel, showed himself to be unworthy, by trying to perform the duties of a priest, <clears throat> upon which God immediately disqualified him from both priest and king. So as we move forward in our review and examination of those things which Jesus could have cited, was the person, <clears throat> the kingship, and the priesthood of Mel Melchizedek. We read of Melchizedek very briefly. And some say very mysteriously. In the writings of Moses, Kizedek appears only in Genesis 14 and is later referred to in a single verse in Psalm 110 verse 4 which says, and that should be the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> now that's a prophecy in Psalm 110, referring to Jesus Christ refer and referring to him prophetically as also being worthy of being king and priest. <clears throat> Let's read now everything that Moses wrote of Melchizedek. Quote, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, which means king of peace, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, <clears throat> and he gave him tithes of all. He, Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. In Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20, just those three brief verses. <clears throat> of Melchizedek, Matthew Henry writes this, this paragraph begins with the mention of the respect which the king of Sodom paid to Abraham at his return from the slaughter of the kings. <clears throat> Before a particular account is given of this, the story of Melchizedek is briefly related concerning whom observe Number one, who he was. He was the king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. And other glorious things are said of him in Hebrews 7, 7 1, etc. The rabbin and most of our rabbinical writers conclude that Melchizedek was Shem, the son of Noah, who was king and priest to those that descended from him, according to the patriarchal patriarchal model. <clears throat> now this was the rabbinical um, understanding of him. 
It doesn't mean that's exactly who he was, but that's who, he under, who they understood him to be. But this is not at all probable, Matthew Henry agrees to me. Well, why should his name be changed? And how came he to settle in Canaan? Now, in all honesty, although I sincerely doubt that it was Shem, I don't think that there's just cause in asking the question, why should his name be changed? Because Abram, who paid tithes to Melchizedek, had his own name changed by God himself. <clears throat> and so changing names for people certainly something that we can say was part of God's, God's job description, not limited to the Old Testament. Because that God of the Old Testament who became Jesus Christ, because he was the creator, and I hasten to add, <clears throat> uh, Jesus' own words, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Changed the name of Peter. And may well have been who changed the name from Saul, Saul of Tarshish to Paul. For too many Christian writers have thought that this was an appearance of the Son of God himself, our Lord Jesus, known to Abram at this time by the name, by this name, and afterwards. Hagar called him by another name. As we read in Genesis 16, 13. He appeared to him as a righteous king owning a righteous cause and giving peace. It's difficult to imagine that any mere man should be said, as it does in Hebrews 7, to be without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. That is not <clears throat> a description of anyone in a book so rich with genealogies listing everybody's forebears before them. And here's someone without father, mother, descent, be neither beginning of days or end of life. So this is truly a mysterious individual. <clears throat> And who served the Almighty God as both king and priest, and that should not be minimized. It is witnessed of Melchizedek that he liveth and that he abideth a priest continually. The apostle, the apostle makes of him, makes him of these that are spoken of to be our Lord, who sprang out of Judah. Judah. <clears throat> well, if he abideth a priest continually. Who abides continually? So the idea that this was a, a uh, manifestation of Christ before his human birth is extremely likely. So the apostle makes him of whom these things are spoken of to be our Lord who sprang out of Judah. It is likewise difficult to think that any mere man should at this time be greater than Abram in the things of God. That Christ should be a priest after the order of any mere man, and that any human priesthood should so, so, so far excel. That of Aaron it is certain that Melchizedek did. <clears throat> so Jesus was to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and not after the order of Aaron, who was a Levite, Jesus was of the line of Judah. And violin says, Jesus, since he had no beginning or end, well, kids that could have been the pre-incarnate Christ. Yes, that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> that's exactly what I'm saying. And I think it's, I mean, look. I mean, let's face it. Look, look how he's look how he's described. He's a priest of the Most High God, who abideth continually, without father, mother, descent, beginning of days or end of life. 
And he's the king of peace. Do I, do I need to draw a map? I mean, really, it's, it's so obvious as to who Melchizedek was and to, and to reduce him down to Shem under a different name. Oh, and let's not forget, this is, this is coming from the rabbinical <clears throat> council. And so, you know, they are limited in their understanding and application of the scriptures in terms of interpreting them. Number three, the most commonly received opinion is that Melchizedek, all right, let's emphasize this now. The most commonly received opinion, doesn't mean it was correct, is that Melchizedek was a Canaanitish prince <clears throat> that reigned in Salem, which was, a, which was an area, and kept up the true religion there. But if so, why his name should occur only here in all the story of Abraham or Abram and why Abram should have had altars of his own and not attend the altars of his neighbor Melchizedek who was greater than he seems unaccountable unaccountable, unworkable, illogical <clears throat> and I ask what Canaanitish prince was without father and mother, without beginning of days or end of life. So the most commonly received opinion is a fairly baseless and pointless opinion, in, in my humble opinion. <clears throat> now, Mr. Gregory of Oxford tells us that the Arabic katena which he builds much upon the authority of, gives this account of Melchizedek. That he was the son of Heraclem, son of Peleg, the son of Eber, and that his mother's name was Salathiel, the daughter of Gomer, the son of Japheth, the son of Noah. So they don't have him even as being Shem or descending through Shem, but ra rather being a descendant of Japheth. But it occurs to me here, I'm, I'm seeing all these fathers and mothers while the, while the scriptural notation said he was without father and mother. <clears throat> so I'm sorry, Mr. Gregory of Oxford, but your, your understanding of it does not live up to scriptural notation. Number two, what he did. He brought forth bread and wine for the refreshment of Abram and his soldiers and in congratulation of their victory. Uh, there was a raiding party. Lot was kidnapped. He stole everything that, that many p different uh, tribes there had. <clears throat> Abram raised up an army, got everything back, and then paid a tithe of that booty to Melchizedek. Now this he did as a king, teaching us to do good and to communicate and to be given to hospitality according to our ability. <clears throat> In representing the spiritual provisions of strength and comfort which Christ has laid up for us in the covenant of grace for our refreshment when we are wearied with our spiritual conflicts. Number two, as priest of the Most High God, he blessed Abram, which we may suppose a greater refreshment to Abram than his bread and wine were. <clears throat> Thus, God, having raised up his son Jesus, has sent him to bless us as one having authority. And those whom he blesses are blessed indeed. Christ went to heaven when he was blessing his disciples in Luke 24, 51. For this, for this is what he ever lives to do. He blesses us, and as Hebrews 7, 25 tells us, he ever lives <clears throat> to make intercession for us. And we certainly need ongoing intercession. 
Number three, what he said, Genesis 14, 19 to 20. Two things were said by him. Number one, he blessed Abram from God. Blessed be Abraham, blessed of the Most High God. Observe the titles here he gives to God, which are very glorious. Number one, the Most High God, which bespeaks his absolute perfections in himself and his sovereign dominion over all the creatures. He is King of Kings. <clears throat> it will be great, greatly help. It will greatly help both our faith and our reverence in prayer to I God as the Most High God and to call Him so. Number two, possessor of heaven and earth, that is, rightful owner. And sovereign Lord <clears throat> of all the creatures because he made them. This bespeaks him a great God and greatly to be praised in Psalm 21 and verse 4. And those are happy people who have an interest in his favor and love. Number two, he blessed God for Abraham in Genesis 14, 20. And blessed be the most high God. Note number one. In all our prayers, we must praise God. And join hallelujahs with all our, all our hosannas. These are the spiritual sacrifices we must offer up daily. And upon particular occasions. <clears throat> To God as the Most High God must have the glory of all our victories, as we see in Exodus 7.15, 1 Samuel 7.10, 1 Samuel 7.12, Judges 5, 1 to 2, 2 Chronicles 20.21. 20, in them he shows himself higher than all our enemies, see Exodus 18.11, and higher than we, for without him, we could do nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. We ought to give thanks for others' others' mercies as for our own, triumphing with those that triumph. And number four, Jesus Christ, our great high priest is the mediator both of our prayers and praises, not only offers up ours, but his own for us. See Luke 20, rather 10, verse 21 for that. Number four, what was done to him? Abraham gave him tithes of all, that is, of the spoils. In Hebrews 7, 4, this may be looked upon, one, as gratuity presented to Melchizedek by way of return for his tokens of respect. Note, those that receive kindness should show kindness. Gratitude is one of nature's laws. Two, as an offering vowed and dedicated to the Most High God, and therefore put into the hands of Melchizedek his priest. Note number one, when we have received some signal mercy from God, it is very fit we should express our thankfulness by some special act of pious charity. God must always have his dues out of our substance, especially when, by any particular province, he has either preserved or increased it to us. Number 
Finally, Matthew Henry says, the tenth of our increase is a very fit proportion to be set apart for the honor of God and the service of his sanctuary. Number three, that Jesus Christ, our great Melchizedek, is to have homage done, done him and to be humbly acknowledged by every one of us as our king and priest. And not only tithe of all, but all we have must be surrendered and given up to him. Unquote from Matthew Henry. Let's move forward, though, still in the book of Genesis, to the next occasion of where Moses symbolically wrote of Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures, this time symbolized by Abraham and his son Isaac. Moses is recognized by scholars as having written this account, which is rich in symbolism, as it unveils many facets of, of the life and sacrifice <clears throat> of Christ. We will read the entire account to get the full picture as it appears, beginning in Genesis 22. Quote, and it came to pass, after these things, that God did tempt Abraham. <clears throat> and we'll look at that a little closer in a minute. And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Here I am. And he said, Take now thy son thine only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. <clears throat> and just as when Abraham was told that he was going to be moving, but he wouldn't tell him where, And in response to that command, even though he says to offer him for a burnt offering, you read in beginning in verse 3, Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes <clears throat> and saw the place far off. And Violence writes, Abraham was the first person to travel on a rabbit trail of sorts. <clears throat> at least the first recorded person to travel on a rabbit trail. Verse 5, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I, will, and I and the lad will go up yonder and worship, and come again to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went both off of them to, and they went both of them together. <clears throat> Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, "My father." And he said, "Here am I. Here am I, my son." He said, "Behold the fire and the wood." Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And so they went, both of them together. <clears throat> I want to stop right there and just point a couple of things out myself. I read in a commentary 
and I couldn't tell you where it was, or perhaps it was in a sermon many years ago, that when Isaac asked, where is the lamb? I believe it was in a sermon. The minister said, the entire Old Testament asks that question. Where is the lamb? And it is, it is answered in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. And John the Baptist looks up and sees Christ coming to him at the River Jordan and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. <clears throat> and in response to Isaac's question, Where is the Lamb? We could read this one of two ways and both will be correct. But Abraham responded, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. Or we can read it as I think it should be read. My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering, which is exactly what happened. Jesus was God in the flesh who provided himself he said no man takes my life from me i lay it down <clears throat> god provided himself as that lamb for the burn offering verse 9 and they came to the place which god had told them of and abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, <clears throat> and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So he had that knife in his hand, <clears throat> raised it over his head to plunge it into his son, Verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. <clears throat> and we can certainly say the same thing of God the Father. He did not with, withhold His only begotten Son from us. Verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and, and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for the burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. <clears throat> now let's think about a couple of things here. First, the mount is never named in this account. He said, go to the land of Moriah. Now, as I understand it, the temple mount is Mount Moriah. You have the Mount of Olives on one side, and there's the Kidron Valley, and Mount Moriah is where the temple is. Some people say that it was on Mount Moriah <clears throat> that uh, this thing with Abraham and Isaac took place. God only told him to go to the land of Moriah. He never said to go to Mount Moriah. He said he would identify which mount to take him to. And so the thing that occurs to me, first of all, about this last paragraph that we're reading is that I think there's a very good chance seeing repeatedly God's precision and his exactness in getting things done. <clears throat> that in the land of Moriah, not on Mount Moriah, but in the land of Moriah, the mount that God chose Abraham to sacrifice Isaac was the same mount across from the Mount of Olives. There's a, 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 several mountains in that area. 
but it was the same mount on which Jesus was crucified. I believe God would have done that. And I also believe in, in support of that, that the name of the mount was not named so that it would not be <clears throat> recognized as the mount and there would be things on to the temple perhaps or other places that they wouldn't have crucified him there. But by making that mount anonymous, and the mount that Jesus was on was available for him to be crucified on, and that it was the very mount where Isaac was, was destined to be offered, as identified by God. <clears throat> That's just my thought. One other thing. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a ram behind him, uh, caught in a thicket by his horns. Think this ram was not trying to get away? Caught in a thicket. Do you think for a second? I mean, we're, we're city folk, most of us. <clears throat> the only rams I ever really saw was in Israel when I was there in 79. Perhaps to a farming trip I took to my son where they had various farm animals. But I believe this, son, this ram was trying to free himself. And that ram was, a, was absolutely a picture of Christ in two ways. Number one, it was, it was sacrificed in place of Isaac, but also even in his horns being caught in that thicket and him trying to free himself from it. Did not Jesus try to free himself from his fate on the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane? And he said, Father, all things are possible to you. If there's, if there's another way that I don't have to drink this cup, but thy will be done. So everything about this ram, being caught in the thicket, it doesn't say he was trying to free himself. That's a given. And then being sacrificed. That's the very picture of Jesus Christ. It just, to me, it just is. <clears throat> Albert Barnes tells us of this grand crisis. The crowning event in the history of Abraham now takes place. Every needful preparation has been made for it. He's been called to a high and singular, des singular destiny. With expectant acquiescence, he has obeyed the call. By the delay in the fulfillment of the promise, he has been taught to believe in the Lord on his simple word. Hence, as one born again, he has taken into account, <clears throat> he, has, he has been taken into covenant with God. He has been commanded to walk in holiness and circumcised in token of his possessing the faith which purifieth the heart. He has become the intercessor and the prophet, and he has at length become the parent of the child of promise. He has now something of unspeakable worth by which his spiritual character may be thoroughly tested. <clears throat> Since the hour in which he believed in the Lord, the features of his resemblance to God have been shining more and more through the darkness of his fallen nature. Freedom of resolve, holiness of walk, interposing benevolence and paternal affection. The last prepares the way for the highest point of moral likeness. God tests Abraham's unreserved obedience to his will. 
the God, the true, eternal, and only God, not any tempter to evil, such as the serpent or his own thoughts, tempted Abraham. To tempt is originally to try, to prove, to put it to the test, and it belongs to the dignity of a moral being to be put to a moral problem. <clears throat> Such a saying of the will and conscience is worthy both of God and the assayer of the man of the of the man and of the man the assayed. So being put to a test is worthy of God and the one he's testing because he's proving him. He's not tempting him. There's a difference. I'm only one. The only one born of Sarah and heir of the promise. Isaac, whom thou lovest, an only child gathers round it all the affections of the parent's heart. Now let's look at this, the land of Moriah. <clears throat> this term, though, applied in 2 Chronicles 3.1 to the mount on which the temple of Solomon was built, is here the name of a country containing it. It may be a range of mountains or other notable place to which it was especially appropriated. Its formation and meaning are doubt, very doubtful, and there is nothing in the context to lend us any, any aid in its explanation. It was evidently known to Abraham before he set out on his present journey. Is not to be identified with Mora in Genesis 12:6, as the two names which occur in the same document and being different in form, they naturally denote different things. Mora is probably the name of a man. Moriah is probably refers to some event that had occurred in the land, or some characteristic of its inhabitants. <clears throat> Offer him for a burnt offering. Abraham must have felt the outward inconsistency between the sacrifice of his son and the promise that in him his seed should be called. But in the triumph, triumph of faith, he accounted that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. On no other principle can the prompt Mute, unquestioning obedience of Abraham be explained. When he told the two servants that he brought with him, the lad and I are going to go over there and make an offering, and we're coming back. And so Abraham fully understood that the nations would be blessed through Isaac. <clears throat> and now God is telling him to sacrifice Isaac. And so, yes fully expected how to raise him up. He was going to obey him before he raised him up. A human sacrifice may have may have been may have been not unknown, but this is in no way met the special difficulty of the promise. The existence of such a custom might seem to have smoothed away the difficulty of a parent offering the sacrifice of a son. But the moral difficulty of human sacrifice is not so removed. The only solution of this is what the ease itself actually presents, namely, the divine command. It is evident that the absolute creator has by right entire control over his creatures. He is no doubt bound by his eternal rectitude and to do no wrong to his moral creatures, but the creatures in the present case, the creature singularly, Abraham, Abraham in the present case, 
has forfeited the life that was given by sin. And moreover, we cannot deny that the Almighty may, for a fit moral purpose, direct the sacrifice of a holy being who should eventually receive a due recompense for such a degree of voluntary obedience. On one of the hills of which I will tell thee. This form of expression cl- clearly shows that Moriah was not at this time the name of the particular hill on which the sacrifice was to be offered. It was the general designation of the country in which a range of hills on one of which the solemn transaction was to take place. Quote, and a- Abraham rose up early in the morning. There's no hesitation or lingering in the patriarch. If this has to be done, let it be done at once. I mean, Abraham just gets up and without hesitation leaves to take care of and, and obey that command. The story is now told with exquisite simplicity. On the third day, from Beersheba to to Shalem of of Melchizedek, or that should be Salem, I guess, near which this hill is supposed to have been, is about 45 miles. If they proceeded 15 miles on the first broken day, 20 on the second, and 10 on the third, they would come within sight of the place early on the third day. It says that Abraham lifted up his eyes. and saw the land afar off. It's scarcely necessary to remind the reader of the Bible that this phrase does not imply that the place was above his point of view. Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the vale of Jordan, in Genesis 13.10, which was considerably below the position of the, of the observer. And then Abraham's words to his servants, and return to you. <clears throat> the intimation that he and the lad would return they seem to have rested on a dim present, presentiment that God would restore Isaac to him, even if sacrificed. But it is more in keeping with the earnestness of the whole transaction to regard it as a mere concealment of his purpose from his servants. And he bound Isaac his son. <clears throat> There's a wonderful pathos in the words his son, his father, introduced in the sacred style in this and similar narratives. Isaac, when the trying moment came, seems to have made no resistance to his father's will. The binding was merely a sacrificial custom. He must have concluded that his father was in all this obeying the will of God, though he gave him only a distant hint that it was so. Abraham is thoroughly in earnest in the whole procedure. <clears throat> That's certainly true. But we see what by, by we see what's what was happening there. This critical moment, the angel of the Lord interposes to prevent the actual sacrifice. Lay not thy hand upon the lad. Here we have the evidence of a voice from heaven that God does not accept of human victims. Man is morally unclean, and therefore unfit for a sacrifice. He is moreover not in any sense a victim, but a doomed culprit for whom the victim has to be provided. I 
think that's an interesting <clears throat> description of our condition being doomed culprits. And for a typical sacrifice that cannot take away sin but only shadow forth, the efficacious sacrifice, man is neither fit nor necessary. The lamb without blemish, that has no penal or protracted suffering, is sufficient for a symbol of the real atonement. The intention, therefore, in this case, was enough, and that was now seen to be real. Now I know that thou fearest God. <clears throat> and it was in his actions... God was able to know that. This was known to God antecedent to the event that demonstrated it. But the original, I have known, denotes an eventual knowing, a discovering by actual experiment. And this observable probation of Adam, of Abraham rather, was necessary for the judicial eye of God who is to govern the world, and for the conscience of man, who is to be instructed by practice as well as principle. Thou hast not withheld thy son from me. This voluntary surrender of all that was dear to him, of all that he could in any sense call his own, forms the keystone of Abraham's spiritual experience. He is henceforth a tried man. <clears throat> ran behind. For behind we have one in the Samaritan, the Septuagint, and some manuscripts, but neither a single ram nor a certain ram adds anything suitable to the sense. We therefore retain the received reading. The voice from heaven was heard behind Abraham, who on turning back and lifting up his eyes, saw the ram. And so that voice, Abraham hurt not the lad, uh, just as he was about to lower the knife, caused him to turn around to be able to see the ram caught in the thicket. This Abraham took an offer, uh, took and offered as a substitute for I Isaac, both in the intention and in the act. He rises to a higher resemblance to God. <clears throat> he withholds not his only son in intent, and yet, in fact, he offers a substitute for his son. Jehovah Jireh is, is Hebrew for the Lord will provide, and is a deeply significant name. He who provided the ram caught in the thicket will provide the really atoning victim, of which the ram was a type. <clears throat> In this event, we can imagine Abraham seeing the day of that preeminent seed, who should in the fullness of time actually take away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In the mount of the Lord he will be seen. This proverb remained as a monument of this transaction in the time of his sacred writer, of the sacred writer. The mount of the Lord here means the very height of the trial into which he brings his saints. There he will certainly appear in due time and for their deliverance. <clears throat> And so by these three references that we see tonight, that in Abraham's seed all the nations of the world would be blessed, and that seed was Christ, in the person of the king and priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek, we see Christ being referred to directly and indirectly, if we could say it that way, and in the order to sacrifice his only son as God identified him because he was the only son of him and, and Sarah 
He was the only son of promise. Jesus himself is a son of promise through the various prophets, for unto us a child is born, for example. And the very words from Abraham that God would provide himself a lamb are all significant points to Christ. And the fact that the the ram that was caught and was trying to free himself was nonetheless sacrificed. All of these are powerful pictures. Powerful pictures. Jesus certainly could have used he was consoling those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. There's many more things that we need to review and examine. And I hope that all of you that are hearing or reading these words will join me in future weeks at this same place and time as we examine them. God willing, I plan to be here to do that. I hope all of you are too. And for those of you who thought I was just about to say it, and you would be correct, this concludes this evening's discussion, beginning with Moses. Part 4. But, ladies and gentlemen, we are not quite done yet. Violinist, would you please conclude tonight's session with a piece or two, sir, on the violin? The floor is yours. It's right there. It's on the TV. Yeah.